So let's look at an example of overhypotheses in action, which is quite fun, having to do with structure dependence, the fact that linguistic generalizations depend on linguistic structure as opposed to other more surface properties, right? And a specific example of this, again, is word order. And we can, and we've actually talked about an example before about complex yes-no question formation in English, where it seems that by three years old, children have some very specific constraints on the hypotheses they'll actually consider. I mean, they're not perfect, but they definitely are not considering everything out there, including some very basic and seemingly simpler hypotheses that are not structure dependent. So how could they learn this? Now there's a potential input issue with respect to yes-no questions because most of the yes-no question data that children encounter, particularly before the age of three, consists of very simple yes-no questions like this one, right, which are compatible with a lot of different rules which we've talked about before. You know, these are different rules that are, explain how you can get from here to here to get this yes-no question. And you know what? There are a bunch of them. Only this one down here actually involves the structure of the clause in order to figure out what's going on. This is in fact the correct rule, but the problem is that all of these are just as compatible with these data, right? So how could you learn that structure dependence is the way to go? Well, the structure dependence is a very general property about language, right? It could be an overhypothesis about language. So the idea would be this overhypothesis would connect to many other structures besides yes, no question. That's just one of the properties in language that it connects to, but it would also connect to, say, WH question formation, or even just in general, how we organize structures in our language, how we group things to explain how we generate new sentences of our language, right? This could be a very general, abstract rule. So, children could therefore encounter a lot of data from these other things that might favor structured representations over unstructured ones that say only care about the linear order of the words, right, a simpler one. And so those other data might cause children to, therefore, in their overhypothesis, prefer structured representations. So this idea was investigated in a paper by Perforce, Tenenbaum, and Revere in 2011 using a computational level model learner, an idealized learner. And this learner learned from realistic samples of child-directed English speech that had been abstracted into syntactic category sequences. So they assumed that your, their learner had already figured out what categories things were. But that's all you get. You don't get any sort of additional structure given to you. You just get these sequences, right? And you're supposed to figure out from these sequences what kind of representations you prefer, right? So there are different types of grammars available. There's actually a, sort of an additional abstraction on top, whether you prefer structure dependent or say ones that are just based on the linear order of words or syntactic categories occurring, right? And then once you, within each of those, there are specific grammars of each type, different say structure dependent grammars, which they talk about. And then it's those that then connect to specific structures in the observable data. So we actually have two levels of abstraction in this particular study. And in the one that we're interested in talking about the specific constraints that kids have are about what types of grammars they're willing to consider structure dependent or not. So using Bayesian inference, Perforce, Tenenbaum, and Ruggier try to infer the best grammar type, as well as the specific grammar, that accounts for the child-directed speech data and the acquisitional intake. So you know, using something that's very similar to the Bayesian inference that we've been talking about. And the idea is that the priors in this case, unlike many of the examples we've discussed previously, they aren't equal because structure dependent grammars are actually much more complex than the other grammar types being considered. So they actually have a lower prior probability than the other grammars that are wrong. This means that structure dependent grammars are actually disfavored beforehand a priori because of their complexity. So that means that in order to really prefer them, they have to do a much better job of accounting for the data in order to be preferred. Right? So this is exactly what happens. Given the data in child-directed speech, the grammar type that's inferred is structure-dependent. Right? So even for the earliest child-directed speech samples directed at children two years old, the structure-dependent grammar types are preferred. Right? So this is a way, and then why is this? Because many different data types favor structure-dependent representations for a specific structure-dependent grammar, which is a type of 
structured or pungent grammar, right? You're getting a lot of stuff favoring that kind of grammar type from a lot of other properties and examples in the language, even if they aren't, say, yes, no questions. So this could explain that why for yes, no questions and other things that by three years old, children have some very specific structure dependent constraints on their hypotheses about word order.